Hello, good morning, happy Friday, boy. We need a Friday. <laughs> How are you guys? Hello, hello, hello. I Turgent, thank you. Wow, 10 months. You're almost to your subversary. Almost to your song. You just have to keep it another two months. Hello, 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 hello. So guys, I have a funny story to, to share with you. Um, I had a little bit of a delay because I actually got my box of stuff from Ron, which is preview minis for the Kickstarter. Um, he sent me he sent me five minis that I think are the same that he sent to all of our preview streamers. I'm pretty sure that everybody got the same five preview minis. Um, but he sent me a dragon. However, it is only a portion of a dragon. He forgot the limbs and he forgot the face. <laughs> so he sent me a headless, limbless dragon. <laughs> so I got to text him and say, uh, cause he's like, it doesn't have a name yet and it doesn't have any particular color it needs to be. Uh, and I'm like, well, I could help you with the name if it had a face. <laughs> <laughs> this is textbook Ron. Trust me on this, okay? Trust me. I texted him on it this morning. I got this dough. <laughs> right, exactly, Lady Nim. His name is now Stumpy. Him or her actually could be either. Could be either. Last time I named a dragon in the last Kickstarter, Shivinro was my name. So, and I and I insisted that it be a girl dragon because we didn't have enough girl dragons. So, um. Yes, yeah, their name, exactly. French Revolution Dragon. <laughs> You're so awesome, <laughs> Montana. <laughs> ah. Oh, quit telling us it's always Friday for you, Corsair. Enough of that. Enough of that. Those of us who still have to work um, give you skeptical looks. Just saying. So yeah, so there we go. So that's my funny story is uh, Ron totally uh, not sending me the dragon. Um, but he sent me these other things and I haven't even looked at them. Like I have not even, I glanced at each in the packaging, but I didn't actually look at what they are. So I should actually look at them. I'm sure you guys, have you seen anything from anybody else? Like Rhonda? You're a mom, you're a mom so it's never Friday. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Rhonda's, Rhonda showed you guys the previews. Because I'm betting we all have the same things. Let's see. This one is a female dwarf with a hammer. I like her. She's cute. I approve of female dwarfs. Ah, okay. Yep. And then I've got a little goblin. And then I've got... Uh, tiny. Oh yeah, these are the adventuring party. You're right. Yeah, so these are these are the uh, those dudes, right? Those dudes. Yeah, I don't know what she is. She must be a rogue. She's not evidently wearing much ar armor, and she has a bikini on. It must be a rogue, a barbaria rogue. And then there's a wizard with a star in his hand. Something like that. But yes, so I have those. No, I do not approve of female dwarves with beards. I like my female dwarves to be pretty because I, uh, I identify with female dwarves being fairly short and also a bit stout, although not as much as I used to be. Um, so given that I do not identify with um, bearded women, therefore I, I prefer my female dwarves to be unbearded. Tolkien or no Tolkien. I love Tolkien, but I also, being a writer, know that writers don't necessarily, like, you know, get everything right. <laughs> Alrighty, gonna do some skin tones. Where are my... I need... No, I do not need Doxy Blush. I need Rosy Shadow and uh, Tan Skin. That's what I need. Yeah, I thought that the uh, Adventuring Party... Uh, would have been cool if it had had like a little bit more people in it. Though I didn't look at the wizard. Is the wizard an elf? Because it looked like the torchbearer was human. Mm, can't tell. Oh yeah, is an elf. Okay, yes. Yes, wizard is an elf. 
So we do have all the, we have the classic races. We have the human, the elf, the halfling, and the uh, dwarf. Alrighty. Let us mix up our base skin tone again. Which is pretty much half and half the rosy shadow, because I wanted it to be pinker. This is actually a very nice skin tone to mix with things. It's actually a pretty good rosy skin tone all on its own. Like if I was doing the rosy triad, I would totally start with this and work up with the other colors rather than doing it the other way around. But I do that on skin regularly. I uh, prefer to start dark and work light with skin. And sometimes I do add an additional shadow, but I start definitely like more with my mid shadow. If we're working on a, if we're talking pentads, I don't start with the mid tone, I start a shade down. Right. Tokenists would argue with you, Lady Nim, but that's okay. I don't agree with them either. And yes, it's totally just your vision, and that's it. People either buy into it or they don't. Alrighty, so we've got our base skin tone, which is good because we need to get some other colors figured out for it, I think. Now, when you're working with a a fairly rosy skin tone and you want to mix a shadow for it. Sometimes it helps to use a reddish brown for it. So if I want do want to mix a bit of a shadow color to put like under, under her eyes, eyebrows, for example, like, you know, in the socket of the eye to darken things down, um, I would, because remember it's a tiny model. So that means our shadows need to be a little bit more dark than usual. Um, I'd actually use ruddy leather, which is a reddish brown. So I'm going to mix, I'm going to drag, drag a few drops of this over to this. And I'm just going to grab a little bit of it. I don't want a ton because then it's just going to overwhelm the skin tone. Just a little on the brush there. And we get a shadow. So this is an easy way to create shadows for skin tones. You don't ever want to use a brown that has a lot of black in it. Probably the best browns to use for this are ruddy leather if you're working with more of a rosy skin tone and then uh, muddy brown 9028 or russet brown 9199, although russet can be a little yellow, so, you know, trial and error at your will. Um, Queen of Kings, I tend to avoid, though, if that's the big demoness, I tend to avoid doing really, really big models on this on this stream because they take so long. Because we do um, we do a six model rotation, and so it would take forever to paint a big model like that or a dragon. Um, so I tend to avoid the big stuff. The exception, probably the biggest I get is uh, we did the we did the bronze golem recently, and here I'll put him in frame with this other model so you can see the scale. But he, even he, he took forever and I almost didn't finish him. So doing a really, really large model um, with wings to boot, uh, probably not just because it takes, it takes so long. On this stream, I try to do a bunch of different things because I want to be able to show people different examples of different techniques. So doing one big model all the way through wouldn't really do that. Like we'd spend a lot of time on wings. We'd spend a lot of time on, you know, various things, but I wouldn't get a lot of opportunities to switch it up and talk about different stuff. So we tend not to do the big stuff for that reason. Um, this one, I felt like I was repeating myself way too much and I don't want to really be in that boat again. So from now on, probably the biggest I'm going to do are things like we just did this ogre and finished him out, but he's not too terrible. He's just like maybe a little bit like less than two times as big as a normal figure. Um, but I mean, as far as demons go, we've done tiflings before. Um, Hold on, let me dig out my tiffling. There we go. So Queen of Kings, if you wanted the Hellborn here, we just finished and I did his skin very, very red. And all of the VODs for this stream are up on our Reaper Miniatures YouTube. So you could go and watch the VOD for, it's really, it's right at the beginning of the figure. I think I, the skin was the first thing I did on this figure. 
So if you watch it, then you would uh, see how I did, like what colors I used for this particular skin tone. And that would be a really good one for uh, a demon. And you could look him up. Hold on, let me grab his name. These Vitanis, yeah. So if you look on our YouTube and you search by either the number 44052 or the name, then you probably can find the VODs here. And then you could just look at some of the first ones, probably the two first ones, I would guess would be um, me doing his skin tones. And that could, that could help you out a bit. If you were looking for a red skin tone for a demon. I do tend to go red with demonic skin. So if I did paint that particular model, I'd likely do a, a skin tone similar to that. I hope that helped. And yeah, Quindy has the link to our YouTube in the chat. Yeah, big models on this show. If we just sat and painted one thing, maybe, but I mean, that is boring. I mean, it's the thing, it's really, you lose people that way. They're like, oh, Anne's working on skin again. And we've already, uh, you know, seen that. So I'm actually going to use Creamy Ivory to highlight the skin tone, guys. There. And I'm mixing a highlight with for that by taking, again, a few brushfuls of our base skin color and popping a drop of the, yeah, Creamy Ivory in there. Um, I've also used bleached linen for this. I've used pure white. It doesn't really matter. Uh, usually a warm off white. I don't want to go with any off white with cold colors or grays in it. I just want to build a nice organic highlight. And in my opinion, the best way to build, you know, highlights for skin is to add an off white. So then our starting triad looks like this. No, her face is a mixture of rosy shadow and tanned skin. I wanted to go with a kind of an old recipe I used to use in our, uh, to, uh, to rosy up tan skin a little bit. So these two paints, 50-50. And that's what the, the initial color is here. I did this because I want to make her cheeks very rosy, her cheeks and nose very rosy. Um, and so I wanted to go up with a bit more, but I think the rosy skin triad is both a bit pale and a little bit too pink for what I wanted. Therefore, I used to use this mix a lot. I used to mix it even in pro paint. Um, I would mix a tan like Hill Giant, which was a pinkish brown with um, more of a, a Caucasian skin. And I like that combo. Like almost 500 of them, lady, are on YouTube. Almost 500. You will have a lot of watching if you like to just binge watch painting videos, considering that all of these are, you know, close to an hour and a half. I don't even want to think about how many hours of my life I've spent at this point doing videos for Reaper. I also want to get out um, a liner. I want to definitely line around some of this stuff, so I'm going to grab one. Um, we already talked about different hair colors, and red is just right out Big Apple because... Uh, Red dress plus red hair usually does not work. It might work on this one, depending on how high you take the burgundy, because it's a dark red, but you'd have to go pretty flame red then with her hair. I was strongly leaning toward black or dark brown, but I think I was kind of thinking dark brown was where I wanted to go. I wanted to bring in some more organic um, color, and right now I don't have any earth tones really on her other than the cream, which is gonna go up toward white. Um, we're already doing a ginger. The kitty cat we started yesterday is a ginger. Kitty cat, if you want red hair triad, you should watch me paint the kitty cat. To be a fair, I am actually not really a fan of painting red hair. It's just not my favorite hair color to paint. But yeah, we had a, actually, if you watched the last video on this model, we had a long discussion of different hair colors and like what would work, what wouldn't work. But if you missed that, then sorry about that. But I'd already, I'd already pretty much decided. I let you guys choose the overall color scheme on this one. So, I mean, I reserve the right to choose hair color myself. Uh, we are not going to paint by committee every day. When I don't have a real strong idea, I feel happy asking you guys what you'd like me to do and having a vote is fun every once in a while. But there still has to be an Anne has to like, like this idea and like uh, in, enjoy the idea of painting the models of that. 
I'm going to four to one my liner. So four to one paint to water. Thin it down just a little bit. I'm just, I hate painting skin before I've lined it. I'm just in that like habit so much now that, uh, that to not line the skin feels weird to me. So we're going to spend a moment lining skin. And this will let me kind of define the boundaries of the hair here. She has a uh, hair and then she's got an earring here. So I can kind of line around that. Since I haven't painted the hair at all, I can be messy, which is awesome. I do want to line around the earring though. Yeah, plus, you know, it just wouldn't be as much fun for me. I do like to make the color decisions on my minis sometimes. And since I do this every day for you guys, every weekday anyway, I reserve the right to get a little of my own creativity on every once in a while. Though I'm certainly glad to explain why, if there is a color theory reason, why I wouldn't go. In this case, I don't like red hair with red clothing. Um, I think it's uh, a really annoying combo and I feel like it doesn't work. You don't want to, one of the color theory rules that I go by is, um, and it's like any rule, you can break it, but uh, it's that colors that are close together on the color wheel will fight. So I've got a bunch of one type of red on this dress that I am planning to bring up and highlight. If I also did red hair, the two would be very close together on the color wheel and they would, they would fight a lot. Especially if I brought up the dress um, more with more of a uh, bright red and uh, the hair of course would be more of an orangey kind of color. It would just, it, they tend to clash, they tend to clash. Like this, this may strike you as funny, but when uh, Melisandra or the fire sorceress lady in Game of Thrones, when Jim produced that figure, and um, asked some of us to paint it. Like I heard so much complaining from every mini painter that George had made terrible color decisions in making his fire sorceress uh, red haired with a red dress because it was impossible to make it look good. So just, just wanted to share that with you. It's not just me. Redheads usually don't wear red. There's a reason for that. Let's see, there's a little bit of hair coming down here also, which I missed, so I have to bring that in. She doesn't really have sideburns, but everybody's got some hair right here, so. I think I've got that. Um, and I'm gonna paint over her necklace with the liner uh, because I'll come back and I'll underpaint it with white after the fact to get, because it's so many tiny details. When you've got a necklace like this, don't even try to line all around everything. Just paint it all dark and come back with white. It's actually easier. There we go. So yeah, whenever I have jewelry or small details like this, I'll just fill them in dark. Mostly because, especially against a, uh, a fairer skin tone, that's going to make those details stand out when I go to paint them. And there's a couple of pearls here. And back here, I already got those. So good. Now I'm happier. There. I'm going to get her mouth and her eyes. Oh, that's a good idea, Miss Dimp. Yeah. 
Although, frankly, if, if my friends had ever complained about my color schemes after I offered to paint a model for them, I would have told them, well, you're painting it yourself next time. D&D players who wanted to continue to get me to paint their stuff would always be extremely appreciative and bring me bribes. All right, and we get the line of her, her eyes in here. And she has the, the happy, the happy um, GB like little, like happy cat eyes where they're just little lines. So we actually don't have to paint eyes. Another reason to paint this figure, guys, you don't have to paint eyes. Because she's smiling and her eyes are like squeezed closed. There is no eye to paint. So instead you do want to get the, uh, the, the line of the eye correct though. And we'll refine that a little bit. Yeah, husbands, yeah. Well, read him the riot act. You don't like it? Paint your own. There. Got a little bit thick on my initial lines on the eyes, so now I feel like I've got it. The mouth needs a little bit more. It's a little lopsided. That's true. Saves you thinking. I think I'm gonna actually have to darken the shadow a little bit more, the skin shadow that I mixed. Now that I look at it, when, especially when I thin it, I think it's not gonna be dark enough to give me the shadows I want, the contrast I want. I'm gonna get the mouth a little bit more. So this is always how I paint skin when I'm doing it. It's how I enjoy doing it. Starting with kind of a mid shadow and then blocking in Getting the lining down, getting the uh, features defined, even if I refine them further later. There, that's a better mouth. Nice and broad. I don't quite believe in that, Corsair. I would say the same if it was somebody saying their wife did the same thing. I, having been taken advantage of as far as um, free paint jobs in my past when I was a, a painter who was learning but still better than most of my friends, I have strong feelings about people complaining when you give them a free paint job. I don't care who they are. And Younger painters or painters who are new to the hobby do tend to get taken advantage of that way because they're just so happy that people think their stuff looks good and would want them to paint something for them. But then when somebody complains about your color choices or, or, or like, you know, doesn't think it's, you know, good, then, then it, it backfires on you. So I am very much of the opinion that anybody seeking a paint job, a free paint job for a painter should, uh, be very appreciative. You are you are silly, Shadow Raven. Although in some ways it's, uh, it is easier, right? Because they're telling you what color you want to do things. You get their appreciation for doing it. So it automatically makes you, you know, give, makes you feel good to help people like that. You still get to exercise your hobby. And most of the time, you don't even have to buy the figure. There are many reasons people get talked into painting the adventuring party for their friends. Sometimes though, it can also be a handy excuse for you to not have too much pressure in painting your own things if you're trying to improve. 
So watch out for that. It can it can feel to you like you're doing something nice for your friends and actually be a way for you to evade what you'd really like to be doing. So I'm sh using this shadow, I brought it in much darker and as it dries, you can see that it's dark. It has been a long week, long week, Carly. Right, Big Apple, exactly. If they aren't appreciative, then don't. I, I would charge money anyway, even if you only charge them a little bit. Because doing it for free just uh, re-enables uh, that whole mindset that we have here in uh, North America that uh, art isn't worth anything. That somebody who is enjoying it should uh, have should do it for free, which is totally a mindset that we fight against as creatives. I can't even tell you, like, I think the worst guy, there's a guy who came into paint club once because every once in a while we would get people come to paint club and ask if anybody was doing commissions. And that's cool. I like that. Um, but there was one guy who came in and he got super offended that somebody wouldn't paint his dragon for $15 or less. Like it was, it was for serious. And, uh, there we go. We got, so I'll talk a little bit about my shadows here. Um, but I, that kind of mentality is entirely, and that was his argument. Well, they're enjoying it because it's painting, right? It's fun. It's a hobby. So you, I shouldn't have to pay very much. So yeah, I'm, I'm not a, like, ah, just gives me a bad taste in my mouth because it's so pervasive here in this country. So pervasive. Well, it's your choice, Shadow Raven. It's always your choice. If you want to paint their stuff so that everybody's mini is painted, because otherwise it wouldn't get painted, that's fair. And if you, it helps you practice, then cool. But it can be a double-edged double -edged sword, and that's why I'm bringing this up. It essentially can create an expectation. So that even if the people could have made the time, they won't. Because they'll figure, you know, there are things they'd rather be doing. So yeah, always just be conscious, you know. Be conscious. I don't want to see anybody taken advantage of. All right, so I'm going to put shadow up here. And then we're going to talk about where I put my shadows on this face. After I get this little one up here. There. All right. So, and yes, it's right now is, is pending toward five o'clock shadow. Don't worry. It'll go the other way, but I'm blocking in shadows under the cheekbones here. And I'll bring out this uh, line of the draw again in a second. Um, I'm putting lines around the chin cause there are definitely like, you know, there's a bit of blobs of fat here that we want to bring out because they're in the sculpt. So I definitely shadow. I have to shadow the underside of the chin though too. So. Um, I've got a line underneath the bow of the mouth here, the lower lip, because there's definitely always a shadow here. Now her face is very compacted because she's smiling. And so the muscles are moving around and a lot is getting compressed. So usually there would be more of a space between the lower lip and the chin, but in this, they are all getting pushed together. So you've just got pretty much a line shadow there. Um, I'm going to bring back a highlight on top of the upper lip, but sometimes you want to shade it first because you want that shadow right under the nose to um, to differentiate. You can see that a little bit. I've still got a, a darker shadow under the nose than I have on the upper lip. And then, uh, of course, in the sockets here, the eye sockets underneath the eyebrow, between the eyebrow and the upper eyelid, you're always going to have a shadow right under the cheekbone here. You're always going to have a shadow. Again, I'll come back and add some highlights down here as I move on. Um, the nose should always be a highlight. The eyelids are usually a highlight. I may add just a little bit of shadow here to take them a little bit down because they're usually not as highlighted. I also have to ask if I'm going to put some eyeshadow on her, which I may because she's that kind of character, um, but I'm just not going to work with it right now. I can, I can always bring that in. Makeup should always be the last thing, uh, in my opinion. So you should get everything else right before you start adding in makeup. Uh, 
And I put a little bit of a shadow up here. I painted the, the shadow a little bit over the liner at the top of the hairline here. Because her hair is very poofy, there would be a slight shadow probably under that hairline. But in general, the brow and the forehead are going to be sh shaded. Now, the exception here is this mark right here between her eyebrows, where the eyebrows meet where you've got the nose, uh, right before the nose juts out. This, there's almost always a shadow here. There's a dip. You can feel it on your own face. So don't forget to put that shadow in. It helps add to the realism of the face to paint that shadow in right there. So the little things that people forget to do or don't know to do are that little shadow between the brows the shadow under the nose, and the shadow under that lower lip. Those are all shadows that people typically forget to put onto 28 millimeter faces that are perfectly attainable and that make the face look better. Any questions? Yeah. Yep, 250 bucks. That's a, that's a pretty standard. I take fewer and fewer, like these days I'm taking fewer and fewer commissions. Okay, I'm gonna finish up my current load of commissions that I have and then it's a real question mark whether I'm gonna take any more, even at 250 a pop. Alrighty, so touching up a bit of decolletage, but I think we've got, I've gotten to put the shadow in here though. Let's grab the shadow, so here, ah. I'm dropping paint, but that's all right. If I need it, I can grab it. So a shadow here between the um, breasts and then a bit of a shadow here between the shoulder and the uh, decolletage on both sides. You can see an indentation. You should shade that. We'll be highlighting everything and that will help to bring that out. If you want to put a little bit of a line of shadow on right next to the necklace, that also would be fairly decent. Good, good placement. And we've got our shadows there. And then here we've got shadows again on the back between the shoulder and the back and then down the middle of the back where the spine is. So we want to shade those as well. Yeah, $45 for a high tabletop is ridiculously cheap in, in my opinion. But then I, I'm trying to remember what I used to get for, because most of the models I painted for eBay, I would say were high tabletop. Some were a little bit more. And I definitely got between, at my lowest, I got between 50 and 100 each. But it was nice when I was doing eBay and getting the prices because then if anybody ever complained about prices, I would say, well, that is my average on eBay. So I could just be painting something that I like and selling it and getting that much money. So why should I paint for you for less? Kind of helped me establish my own worth in my head, which I had, a trouble, had trouble doing. I think a lot of artists and creatives do have a hard time putting a price tag on what they do. Just bringing in my base coat, touching up a little bit here so that I can get my shadows and they're not too overwhelming. Blend them in a little bit. I will paint um, for my family for gifts. Like I think I'm probably gonna paint a piece for my brother next year for Christmas. Cause he hates, he hates doing Christmas with like gift cards, which is what my family usually does. He wants the gifts to mean something, so. But otherwise, if any of my family approached me for a piece, I would ask them to pay for it. I'd give them a discount, but I would ask them to pay for it if it wasn't uh, something I was painting for them. Because no matter what it is, it's going to take up my time. And if it's something I wouldn't otherwise choose to paint, 
i.e. doing a gift for them, then they're essentially taking me away from all the other things I do. Now, it's different if you have a real job, quote unquote. I shouldn't use that phrase. It's different if you have like a full-time job or something that takes a lot of your time, um, I suppose, as opposed to where all my time is. Like if I don't, if I take a little bit of my time out of my schedule, I lose money. Um, and it's different probably if you're paid hourly and have a regular salary coming in and then you choose what to do with your free time as you wish. Um, I don't know. in different mindsets. That's just my own. For me, I'm very cognizant that I am the only one paying the bills and every hour that I, that I use in a particular pursuit is going to affect my bottom line. So don't feel bad if you ask your family to pay for stuff is what I'm saying is you can choose to do it for free. Absolutely. And then you are a very nice and generous person. Um, but don't feel bad if you feel like they should pay. I'm going to thin down this. I have to blend this. The only problem with putting this, um, using the, the ruddy leather is sometimes it makes it hard to blend. It makes it a little blotchy. So I'm working on that. Yeah, exactly. I'm at Zeke. Right. If you don't have, if you're kind of, if your time is kind of your own to just use as you will, for example, if you're retired, um, then that makes total sense that you would be fine with making room in your schedule for a family member's piece, especially if you're still learning. Cause as I mentioned earlier, you know, it is an opportunity to paint something you wouldn't normally paint and you might learn something from it. So you have to weigh all those things when you're thinking about like commissions or painting models for free for people, you know, kind of weigh the pros and cons and ask yourself, ask yourself really if you can feel good about it. That's probably the biggest thing. Can I do this and feel good about this? Or am I going to get resentful because they, I did it for free and they're complaining about the color scheme, you know, and you'll know your, your people you know, to know what kind of experience you're likely to have painting something for them. And often people will be very appreciative as they should be. There we go. Just trying to trim that up a little bit there and throw a little bit of highlight on there. Now I'm going to get up to the face. I'm going to come back down and refine that, but I don't want to get too distracted right now when I tackle the face. So what I am learning from this down here though, is that I need to thin my paint more on my highlight, which makes sense because we added creamy ivory and creamy ivory has a lot of white in it. There's our triad. So we pretty much created our own rosy skin triad. Um, I also want to make a blush color at this point. So I'm going to grab my mid-tone. And I am going to grab a pretty bright red, relatively speaking, I'm going to grab blood red because this lady, uh, I think would have pretty rosy cheeks. Yeah, that's fair, Miss Dimp. It can also give you kind of a motivation or a uh, deadline. A little bit of blood red. There we go. So even a bright red like blood red when mixed with a skin tone will give you a more naturalistic pink color, this rose color I just made. So now here are our colors from shadow, mid-tone, first highlight and blush. I do wanna start popping my blush in at this point. I can also create a highlight for this probably from mixing those, these two together, thus giving me that pale rose color. So that was blood red, which is a color I haven't used for a while. Actually, it's one of our most popular reds in master series it used to be the number three seller. I don't know if it still is, might be. It is one of our nicest reds in my opinion. So I'm going to bring in this pink and see if it's dark enough. Um, the thing is that I may want to make it even more pink because on such a small model, it will be hard, hard for that, that color to carry. But I'm going to kind of use it on her cheeks. I'm 
Yeah, I think I'm gonna want a little bit more red, a little bit more pink. We'll see. I want her, her cheeks to be very pink since she's obviously jolly. So that's fairly pink, actually. I'll go with that for now and see what it looks like after we highlight. Uh, so I wanna grab a little bit more water, throw it into my highlight color. I probably wanna build another highlight color with more white in it. I like Godzilla, so I'm okay with that. I used to watch Godzilla all the time as a kid. So I'm gonna get all the forehead. But remember, don't wipe out that shadow between the uh, brows. But the forehead is generally light. So we can carry that up. Leaving a little bit of shadow under the hair. Again, the lining is there to keep that anchored. I'm gonna get the uh, top of the cheekbones here which again, just like the forehead, this is an area that's close to the bone. So you will see a lighter color. You can see it even on my face here and here. And then you see the, the reddish color go down from that. But because right under the eye is the top of the cheekbone, it's not as fleshy of an area and it tends to not be, a, it not to be, tends not to be pink. You get the pink when you get this, all this fleshy, um, area right there so but right under the eye is usually a lighter and close to your uh, main skin tone plus uh, it's a good place for highlights so because the light will hit the top of the cheekbone and you can use that to draw the attention to the eyes because then you've got those dark eyes and then the highlight right below them she she reminded me of that you know a long time ago actually missed him i think fairy godmother is a good call Though if we, if we wanted to paint her more like a fairy godmother, I probably would have gone with more like a green or blue or purple dress. But she could totally be a fairy godmother. So now I wanna bring in a little bit, I'm gonna mix my mid-tone with this highlight color, try to get something kind of halfway between. Um, and bring up this area a little bit more down here. I still want a hollow here, but I don't want to totally, I don't want to get into like a five o'clock shadow situation. Because she is female. So even though she doesn't really have a jawline, I'm still gonna highlight there as if she does. I'm going to hit the top of the chin. When you've got this much sculpted detail around the face because you've got all these, uh, all these great um, details in her expression, that's when you want to get very little paint on your brush and be very persnickety about um, where your highlights are going. Kind of want to blend that in a little bit, kind of blend it in on this side too. I do want to bring in more of a crease around her mouth. And remember, you don't have to add shadows to get details all the time. You can also add a highlight to bring out a detail. No, I already decided. We already decided. Oh, pink, blue, pink, blue, I see. Yes, of course. All right, so 
To get this crease to be more pronounced, I want to bring the mouth up, I think. I still probably need a darker color for that crease, um, the one at the edges of her face. Like if I smile, we definitely can see a shadow form at the corner of the mouth and it's darker. So I have to like keep that in mind as I'm working here that I may want to bring that in a bit. So after I've got everything blocked in, I go back and I start refining a bit more. And I haven't even brought in like a higher highlight yet. I am going to make her lip color darker and I am going to build something even rosier than in my current rosy blush color. Something darker. I'm going to use the shadow color to do it, I think. Yeah, there we go. So mixing blood red into the shadow color for the skin gives me this much darker, which I can use for a lip color. Mixing uh, this red that I just mixed up with Rogue Shadow gives you a dark purpley color, which I'm gonna use as a deeper shadow underneath this lip to line the mouth more. And then I'm gonna grab this red. So not too unnatural a lipstick color, actually. Gotta be careful with lip color. It's very easy to go too garish with it. I am gonna grab my white so I can mix a highlight for this. I have painted many, many 28 millimeter faces, silver tongue. This one's a challenge though, because uh, it is different, right? It's very, very over-exaggerated. And uh, because the lady has a lot of extra weight, it's uh, it changes the whole shape of the face, but you're still hitting the features the same way you would on a face that was uh, skinnier. There's just a little bit more to accentuate here and there on this one. I'm going to thin this down. Got a lot of white here that I need to thin down. But yeah, I mean, after you, I mean, this is part of the learning process, right? So you've got unconscious lack of proficiency. And then you've got conscious lack of proficiency where you understand that you're, you know, you have a long way to go and you start working on it. And then you have conscious, conscious competency where you're concentrating on it and you're getting better. And then you have unconscious competency where it's, it's, you've done, just done it so many times that that's me essentially. I've painted so many 20, 28 millimeter faces at this point that it really is just, uh, you break it down to steps and you just do those steps over and over again. I mean, everything I'm doing here is just stuff that, you know, I used to have to think about and now I don't. And there's still parts of the face that I have to think a little bit more about because I've like worked in something recently, relatively, meaning the last couple of years, like the shadow between the brows. And I used to always forget the, uh, the shadow or the highlight at the edges of the mouth. We haven't even gotten to there yet. I want to put a little bit of a highlight on that lower lip. But yeah, once you get to a certain level, of uh, having done that so long, so for, for so long, it gets very fast. 
I figured that was a little bit too much highlight. So I'm gonna stronger, get a stronger mouth here. That's better, and now I want a better highlight. But then you reach for new things to try to get proficient at as a painter, and then you slow down again. It's this never ending uh, thing where you start very slow, then you speed up as you get familiar with the techniques, and then you learn a new thing to do, and it slows you down again, and stuff like that. So I did three highlights on that lower lip. One, the middle one is pure white. It's a very, very thin pure white. I'm gonna bring it in just a touch stronger. Now I need to work on the rest of the face. But yeah, the key isn't necessarily to fail fast. The key is to just pay close attention to what you're doing, Silver Tongue. You can learn extremely quickly in this hobby if you approach it with a very mindful attitude. And I always recommend that people choose one technique at a time to really, really concentrate on and get to where they can nail that technique and they really understand why it works. People tend to get impatient and, I, and unfortunately that that holds them up more than anything. They don't realize it. But the idea isn't necessarily to fail faster. It's to experiment slower and with more mindfulness. When I was trying to figure out layering, I slowed myself way down and I spent time, you know, when I was layering and it was too transparent, I wasn't seeing any results. And then I had to, you know, thicken my paint a little bit and try again, right? Oh no, that's too much. And eventually, not, didn't take very long, you know, over the course of a few weeks, I got very good at layering because I was learning the paint consistency and I still had to kind of trial and error it when I was setting up my paints, I had to test. But over time, as I continued to do that, I just stopped testing because I had painted with the correct consistency for so long that now I can just spot it. Like I can just look at my paint palette and I know if I've got it. And that journey to unconscious competency where you just look at your palette and you know that your paint is the right consistency, I mean, that's the eventual result, but what you're more aiming for is just being able to, to be able to hit that correct consistency in the first place. You don't have to be like super pro for that. It's all part of the process. Now, the other highlight that makes a lot of sense is at the corner of the lower mouth here, and she actually has like kind of a roll of tissue there. So I'm gonna grab a highlight. Oh, I do need to mix another highlight. But yeah, failing faster if you're not like kind of A-B testing in your head is, is not going to get you where you want to be. It pays more to paint with mindfulness and to choose like each mini to choose, okay, I'm going to, I've got a big cape here. I'm going to try to layer. I'm going to try to figure out paint consistency for layering with green. And that's going to be my test here. And if you approach every mini where you just work on one thing, one technique, one color, you will get better if you're, you're just, it really is a matter of just like being mindful of what you're doing. Painting faster doesn't not always um, lend itself to mindfulness, to really concentrating on what you're doing and being conscious of what you're doing. Sometimes painting fast, you can end up with a, oh, wow, that worked. But then you weren't necessarily paying enough attention to see what exactly worked. So it doesn't work as well for you. Yeah, I just did a PDF on fear and mini painting Zeistus for my Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash painting big. Um, and fear is a big thing, but... Uh, and for sure, painting faster can help some people get over it. 
I find for me um, that it's more a matter of just starting. Once I'm in it, it's easier for me to keep going and then I can concentrate and get focused and I can pay attention to what I'm doing and the results I'm getting. So even if you start faster, slow yourself down, you'll do yourself a favor. Also tackling it from the mindset of, I'm just gonna have a little fun today and not making it a big thing. No mini is worth stressing that much about. I think I need an even darker shadow. I think I'm gonna mix one for this crease. Um, it's getting there. The face is getting there, but it can be better. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's, everybody is different, right? And ev so everybody has to tackle their fears in a different way in order for things to work. Um, where is my, oh, that's the one I dropped. <laughs> I'm like, where's my ruddy leather? Oh yeah, I dropped a paint and that was the one. I'm gonna actually add a little bit more to this puddle of shadow and make it even darker because I want a hard shadow around the creases of the mouth. Fear is a natural like thing with any creative endeavor, especially if you kind of feel like an imposter because you are quote unquote, not an artist or not artistic or everybody through your life has told you that you are not artistic. Um, but really, I think the answer is to just slow down and say, have fun, give yourself permission to paint something that isn't awesome, but understand that you're still having fun and it's a learning thing, right? We're so, so keyed up to believe that we have to be good at something right away or we're not meant to do it. And that's really kind of bull hooey. Nobody's good at anything right away unless they've prepped for it in a different way. I mean, I was moderately okay with brush control and mini painting because I used my brush like a pencil and I've been drawing since I was a little kid. So my brush control was okay. It doesn't mean I had a natural aptitude for mini painting somehow. But what it was to me, it was, was relaxing and fun. And so I get sad and, and want to help when people are like, oh my God, I've got so much anxiety about this hobby. And it's like, well, um... You know, that's, it's sad to me because this hobby is the opposite. It should be the opposite. It's a really good Zen detox hobby because it gets you into the painting, the tiny figure, concentrating on the tiny details and takes you outside of yourself and makes you not concentrate on the stuff in your life that's making you stressed. So it's sad to me when people have anxiety about the hobby. I get it. I get anxiety about certain projects and I recognize in myself then, you know, oh, I'm avoiding this because I am anxious about the results. And I try to just get over it. If I can't get over it, I put it away for a while. I work on something else. It's not worth like stressing about it. So a little bit more of a shadow around the mouth there to make that crease a little darker. But I guess the other thing in my mental is just that I enjoy challenging myself. So for me, um, tackling a model that could be difficult isn't, isn't a fear inducing thing. I mean, if I try it and I fail, then I fail, but it's more important to me to try it and explore it. And if I fail, then I'm going to learn from that and get better next time. I think if I hadn't had that attitude, I wouldn't be able to write either because at this point I'm in like my 26th revision of my novel and it's rough to have worked on something for so many years and yet to still see, because the editor saw, to still see that there are areas where I really, I need to improve, right? So if I didn't have that attitude of this is, you know, just a learning experience and I can get better. You know, this, I'm going to use this to get better. I think I would just stop. So I'm pinking up the, the, um, the, the, ooh, the, the cheeks a lot more here. Pinking them up. Rosier. Um, 
Yeah, I, I throw them out, estrogen, actually. If I do something and it's a fail, I learn, I, I look at it, I analyze why I shouldn't have done it, and I just throw it out. These days, a fail for me, though, is starting a model that I absolutely lose love with. Um, usually, it's just that I felt obligated to paint a thing, or I jumped in without a clear concept, or it turned out the model had more issues than I discovered. Um, it's very rare. I, I'm trying to think of the last couple models I pitched, but honestly, if if I if I get that level of hate on and I know I won't uh, I won't do it, I'll essentially make a mental note of why didn't this work, and then uh, it goes in the trash. I get it out of my life and I move on to the next thing. I don't dwell on it. I don't sit and stare at it. I don't do any of that crap. If I'm just at a block with something, that's completely different. But there have been less than five models in my life where I feel like it's a fail because when it starts to go that way, I know I have enough experience to know at this point. So I'm trying to think if I even have anything, you guys wouldn't probably wouldn't even call them a fail, but for me, they are. And it's a fail because I don't even want to finish it. Like it's, just done. In reality, I often can rescue things from being a fail, Estro. So like these days, I don't have an example because if something starts to fail and I'm able to stop in time and I realize it, I'm just going to put it aside for a while and then I'm come back and fix it. Acrylic paint, you can paint right over it. Unless you've totally lost love for the model, there's not a reason for it to be a fail. If I can walk away from the model, then come back and change the entire color scheme, then I'm happy. Yeah, exactly, Splat. It is. It's, it's why I used to love doing it so much I, you know, before it became my job, and now it's different. But I can still like get into stuff and just happily paint while I'm listening to a podcast and, you know, zone out and get away from, you know, whatever I might be stressing about at the time. So I'm bringing in these highlights at the corners of her mouth. This one's a little bit too broad. I need to trim that one in. But yeah, if anything really goes south. And usually what I find these days is those are models, the models that go south are the models I've had for a long time. Maybe I even started them at one point and then I put them aside because life intervened or I just got busy or I just was not sure where I was going with them. Then I try to come back to them and it just isn't working for me. I can't get my enthusiasm back up and I'm not happy with where they are now. So that's, that's the point where I pitch a model where I realize, you know what is done. That's why my new philosophy in the last couple years that I've, I've formulated is that I am going to start a model. I'm going to have no more than three models in progress on my bench and I'm not going to start another one until I finish one. Because otherwise, I create those fails. I create a model that I started eons ago that I no longer connect to or have any care about or I'm excited to paint. And so that's that's where I will fail out. So I'm structuring my painting environment now. I don't start a model unless I'm really excited about it. And I'm going to continue with it. And, you know, I avoid starting new models until I finish an old model. Nope, she's sitting over on my table. Actually, I think I lost her ponytail. She fell on the floor and I have to go digging around back there. This is an example of how a model can fail because I constructed her, did the green work on her, and then didn't start her. And now, if a piece of her has popped off and I can't find it, that's going to create a further barrier to me starting her because I have to re-sculpt that piece. So, in reality, I should have kept her on my shelf in here where she was safe and not put her in the hobby room where things tend to get moved around and stuff like that. But I have not finished a model. I finished my Halfling Assassin, and so then I got to start my competition mini for Adepticon. 
but I have not finished that piece, and so I cannot start another model. And to some of you, this may sound restrictive for the fact that it's a hobby, but it works for me. Having structure and challenges are key to my creativity. And I realize that too much freedom doesn't, isn't good for me. Yeah, the sculpt is beautiful. I just won't start it until I finish something. And I'm not even sure I'm going to start that model because Grey Wolf, it's huge. And I want to do it to a very, very high level. It's going to take forever. So I need to be super excited about it. In fact, I'm thinking about just putting her away, finding her ponytail and putting her away. Because right now, if she sits out staring at me, I'm losing enthusiasm by the day. Um... I need to put her out of sight somewhere or somewhere off to the side where I don't look at her every night at my hobby station. I moved her in there because I reorganized my shelf in here, but I'm, I'm realizing that was a bad move. You got to learn your quirks is what it comes down to. I have learned that more structure and more rules for me, you know, self-imposed rules are key to me being able to look forward to painting when I paint for a living. So making, realizing when I feel overwhelmed, realizing what makes me anxious, realizing what isn't working for me, and then making a structure where I can still, you know, where I can work around it. That's important to me to keep things going. And a lot of you are the opposite. You need more freedom in order to feel like you're not stressed by your hobby. But weirdly, I have found that for me, it is the other side of the coin. Yeah, I actually was, I almost couldn't fall asleep on time last night because I was thinking about a totally different model. So I think I know what my, ne my next mini will be. So I really pinked out her nose. That's fine. I wanted that um, kind of feel. Now I'm going for more here. So all these little changes I'm making right now are just little tiny changes and adjustments. Trying to define her expression more and bring things out more. It's coming along pretty well. There's parts I'm probably gonna have to tune a bit, but she's she's coming along there. I want a little bit more highlight here and here. And a little bit more highlight on the brow ridges up here. Now her face is really starting to come out. But yeah, I think Big Wolf is gonna come back in here till I really have like the energy to do it. And as I mentioned, I need to finish a model first. But I at least have a deadline on my, uh, my competition mini, which we've been working on him. I did a lot of fur work last night. Um, we've been working on him on Saturdays, which brings me to the point that I will be streaming tomorrow and I'll be working on that model. Probably on the metal because I've gotten, I've kind of figured out how the fur is going to go now. So I want to work more on the metal. All right. So that face is looking okay. Not bad. I feel like maybe... I'm gonna keep fussing with it until I really, really like it. When you are, thanks for that, Quindy. Yeah, so Quindy just linked to my own Twitch channel. And I've been working on my competition piece and I will do so tomorrow at around uh, 3.30 p.m. USA Central time. Just deepening that crease around her mouth just a little bit. You can add definition with shadows or highlights and your choice, my choice when I make that choice is usually up to uh, like what my skin tone is and the mood of the character. That blorfed, but that's fine. I'm just, uh, using a little bit darker shadows because she is a 28. Now her face is really, really coming out. So I added just those little bit darker shadows. Now 
I can think about a higher highlight on some parts that I haven't highlighted up to now. And I probably, as I said, I'll probably do eye makeup on her, but we'll see. Right now, I think I just want kind of a, her eyeshadow, her shadows in his, under her brow are a little bit neutral, so I would like to rosy those up a little bit. So I'm going to grab a color and see what I can do. Mix kind of a taupe color. So when you've got a model which has such a unique face like this, do spend the time. And I'm using very thin paint, which is going to help me, help keep me from overworking it. Because if you're using thicker paint, you'll, you'll definitely will overwork the area. You'll get like some texture where you don't want it or your paint will get blobby or something like that. But if you're always using paints that are just like heavy glazes or light washes and you're building up color like I am here, you can work on this for a very long time and not be in danger of overworking it. Nothing will get clumpy. Worst thing you might have to do is rebase coat an area if it gets too dark. Adding in highlights here at the jawline, as I mentioned earlier, to kind of, it'll keep, uh, keeping her rosy cheeks, but killing any uh, suggestion of a five o'clock shadow. And I'm using a mixture of my shadow skin tone, the darker red lip color, and a little bit of liner at this point to fill out some shadows. It's not as dark as actual liner. It avoids using too much black, but it's letting me bring in a dark shadow to define areas. So like right under her neck here, I want a strong line. Strong shadow that continues. And for some of these, they're a little bit, the shading is a little bit strong and I'll do a glaze or grab some of my mid-tone which I've almost exhausted because I mixed a bunch of it and then I used it to mix a bunch of other tones. So I don't want that to be too much. So I'm going to glaze. And so my brush come back, lick off any excess. All right, now I want that shadow on the other side of the jaw. But yeah, I will spend this much time on a face because the face is always the most important feature. Unless you're doing a Frazetta. If you have a model where you're trying to emphasize the anonymity of the feature of the, of the figure, say a, a rogue with wearing a mask or a hood, um, then the most important part of the figure becomes something completely different, perhaps the weapons. That's what um, Frazetta did, is he would emphasize like the musculature of the chest and the arms and the weapons, the motion of the weapons, and he would pick out details in armor because that's what, the way he wanted to convey character. He did not waste, <laughs> and, you know, in his perspective, did not waste time on the face if the face was not the point. But, and it worked for his artwork. He was painting a lot of Conan, a lot of Tarzan. Those characters aren't like known for their emotive depth, but they are known for a lot of action. And so that's where he went. So there should be a reason if you paint like that, there should be a reason behind it, a philosophy, if you will. As 
I'm once again attempting to throw paint on the floor and failing. And a little bit of shadow over here. So that's starting to come out very nicely. Now we're progressing. The face is coming along. I'm not like happy, happy with it yet, but it's getting there. Yeah, silver tongue. These are just greeting glasses. I used to be able to paint without them. I used to be able to do this and stay in focus. Then I turned 40 and all went downhill. My warranty expired. Uh, how did I know I was supposed to buy the extended warranty on my eyeballs? Uh, but yeah, these are reading glasses. Um, I use a fairly high, relatively high uh, um, power. So they're, they're three times magnification, 3.0. Uh, I find that I've used like optivizers over them if I need to really see a minuscule detail on a sculpt, like on a Tom Meyer sculpt, but I find that it, most of the time extreme magnification is kind of a waste for me. But yeah, I do these days, my, my vision, my long distance vision is still 20, 20, um, according to my eye doctor. But my uh, close-in vision is not good enough to, to do these guys anymore. So I'm quite accustomed to my reading glasses. I like them. They feel natural to me. I don't feel like I'm wearing some sort of an assembly on my head, which annoys me. So I'm glad that I can get away with these. There are times where a part of a model is so tiny... that I do feel like I need more magnification. And then I stack, then I'll grab David's Optivisor, which I think is a five times, and I'll put it over the top and in front of my reading glasses, which lets you get obscenely close, but it also like just generally makes your model look terrible because then you see all the imperfections in the metal or the plastic or whatever. This model is great because you don't have to do eyes, Lady Nim. Her eyes are pretty much squeezed closed, so. So you should paint this model. I failed because it wasn't $8 null, null oil. Yes. Yes, obviously I have failed in painting this face because I did not use the $8 null oil. Total fail, man. So I wanted to get the, the edge of the jaw there. A little bit of the neck. And that is reading very well now. Okie dokie, that's not bad. We're almost to the end of stream. So one thing you do want to do if you put a dark shadow under the brows like I did is you do want to bring in a little bit more, a little bit of highlight toward the outer side of that. So it should be darkest toward the middle here and I can bring in an extra shadow for that. But if you look at your own eyes or you look at the eyes of models in a magazine or whatever, you'll find that as far as the... Um, under the brow, like you can see it, where it's darkest here. And then as it moves out, I've got more highlight falling. And it depends on the shape of the eye. My eyes actually turn a little bit down so they don't let as much light in as they could if I had like really wide space there. Everybody's different. But in general, you can add a little bit more of a highlight toward the outer edge and make the inner edge a little bit darker and it'll look very natural. I'm gonna mix in, I'll mix up a little bit more of my dark purpley color, just to give you an eyes an idea of the color I'm mixing here, it's this one right here. So this is a dark pinky purpley color, and it is a mixture of this darker red, the a tiny bit of liner, and our shadow skin tone. Um, and I'm using that almost as a weird kind of liner or spot shader to pull dark areas together and give me more contrast. This went a little too dark, so I'm gonna pull it out. There, much better. So essentially it lets me almost line, I need to fix that little blur. It lets me almost line the interior of the face where the creases are 
with a color that's not too disruptive because it still has a lot in common with the skin. And that give me, lets me get this, this tight details and contrast here. Now I did go a little bit too far over with my shadow here. So I'm gonna take my uh, first level highlight and minimize that shadow line there. And then I'm gonna come in with my red rose, rosy color again. And how much contrast you have here is just going to determine. I wanted to go pretty cartoony with her, so I went for higher contrast, darker shadows, brighter highlights on the face. Um. <laughs> Everybody spills an olive oil, huh? That's why there's a 3D print pattern out there to hold a, paint, a Games Workshop paint pot so that it doesn't spill. I've seen those. So this is pretty good. Oh, I feel the knocking the paint on the floor. Yes, yes, for sure. I think this is pretty good. I'll need to make a note of my colors so that I can uh, come back and get, I don't know that I have time to do everything the rest of the highlighting here, I'll try. Yes, I've been knocking things on the uh, knocking things on the floor all stream pretty much. It's, I definitely need uh, need my Friday. Later, I'm gonna watch people play video games after I get my work done. It'll be a nice, relaxing Friday. So just little touches of highlight color to bring up the shoulders here. There's not much room, so you don't need much to suggest the highlights. I still need to do her hands too. That'll have to be done next time. And uh, there isn't much rosiness back here, usually on the back, but if I wanted to, I could mix up my little odd Toby shadow and uh, Add a little bit more strength to what I have. Oh no. Yeah, I bet thunderstorms can uh, definitely be a bit worrisome when you have a 3D printer running. I didn't even think about that. I was thinking that out here 3D printing would just be fraught with peril because of all the micro earthquakes we get if we ever got a printer. Whenever I think of these things, I always go back to the whole, you know, I think I'll just buy my prints on Etsy. <laughs> we know we get microquakes because the paintings go crooked. Even though I never feel anything. It would have to be probably a pretty big earthquake for me to feel it. Yeah, they seem like they're really sensitive, Miss Dimp, so. I 
I don't get any points because I don't really like, there's so much media I don't consume. There's so many memes I don't know because I just don't waste my time on the internet a lot. I miss so many memes. But that's okay. If there's a really good one, David shares it with me. He likes to flop around on Twitter and see the memes. Plus his company has an entire bulletin board that's like dedicated to memes. All right, so that's at least a start on decent highlighting. Yeah. Well, right now I already have so many pretty minis, so right now I'm okay. I don't need more minis right now. I keep telling myself that. I hope if I repeat it enough, I'll believe it. Mostly I wanna get this bust done so I can start something new. All right, guys, I think, I guess I can line her hands really quick and maybe get a quick color, quick color on them. But I think her face is pretty good at this juncture. I might do a little bit more to it later. Again, it's gonna depend on how everything else comes up around it. Um, Cause you know, colors change depending on what you put next to them. And so with that in mind, I may need to change things as we progress with our highlights. Always remember to line your fingers. Always, 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 especially 28 millimeter, even if you put a glaze over it so the lining isn't so harsh, that's perfectly fair. I understand if you don't want really dark lines between your fingers, but always line them anyway, please. Otherwise they just look like mittens. Uh, yeah, and our, I actually uh, talked about that at the beginning of the stream. I had a funny... Ron sent me a, a headless and limbless dragon. We decided its name was Stumpy. He also sent me the adventuring party, which I think everybody's got. But Rhonda's already painted those, so I'm tempted to just paint the dragon during Bone 6. I am not, I don't know what, what dragon it is, nor do I care, nor am I going to, nor am I going to spoiler it for you until I actually have it in my hand, you know, complete in my hands. Once Ron actually sends me a head for the thing and legs, because right now it's a headless flying serpent. I am not going to spoiler it, guys. You're just going to have to wait. You're going to have to wait till the Kickstarter launches to know what dragon I have. Or maybe if Ron is prompt about sending its limbs and head, maybe I will uh, show you. Maybe I'll even let you all vote on what color it should be. I don't know. I might want to do something special to it, so maybe not. <laughs> I don't like to spoiler things too far before. I mean, we're not even halfway through the month. I'm not going to spoiler it. We have more than two weeks till the Kickstarter. It should take Ron at least until next week to get me the replacement parts. So maybe when it's like less than two weeks out, I'll show you guys. Depends. I might have to do some work on it. Maybe I'll speed paint it. But be aware that um, many of our uh, normal models are going to take a back seat at that point to the Bones promotional models. Though I liked Rhonda's paint jobs on the adventuring party and I don't know if I would paint them. Grey Wolf, every person at Reaper 
who is in a command position needs a secretary. And all of them are too stubborn and or too cheap to get one. <laughs> to be fair, if we got everybody a secretary that needed a secretary, we'd be paying a lot of money for an additional like five or so employees. And uh, I don't know that Reaper could afford that. So, but yes, Ed, Ed at least, and Ron in particular have needed personal assistance for a very long time. Nah. Yeah, I don't, I don't really like, I like to paint terrain for myself, but I don't do a bang up job on it. Like I just want to do it for fun. So it, it wouldn't really be something I would enjoy painting on stream. Gonna add some pink to her knuckles and get the shadow going on down here. Ah, okay. But yeah, no, I won't get any other um, Bones 5 uh, promos. Whatever I get is going to be all I get, I suspect. Like if Ronald just sent me the pieces he forgot to send me for the, uh, the Dargan, and uh, we'll move on. And pretty much, I think we're okay. What we did today, boy, we did skin tones. I talked a lot. I did my my full workup when I'm working on uh, on skin and trying to do it really well. I take a long time to do it, and I pay attention to many of the smallest details, um, which is exactly what we did on the face up here. I also talked about like emphasizing features and places to put highlights that you might not think about um, and places to put shadows that you might not think about, but which will give your faces a much more realistic look. So given all that, if you missed the first part of the stream, go on back and watch the VOD if you're interested in that. Um, I don't often spend this much time painting a face on the stream. So this is kind of an example for you guys of how much time I, I normally spend when I really want to do a, a good job. And honestly, there's probably still more I want to do on her. I just need to get the hair blocked in to really assess how, how pale or unpale the skin looks to really get an idea of where I want to go with it. Ah, yes, Reaper Land. Indeedy. Sweet. So that's what we did. <laughs> no freeze on this stream. Well, maybe when we get to our, maybe when we get to our 500th episode, Quindy, I'm depending on Quindy to give me notice when that's coming so that we can plan. We can plan our giveaways um, and how much we want to give away and how much you people really deserve for us to give away. Mm hmm. But anyway, if you're interested in face painting, do please watch the VOD on this one if you did not stick with us through the whole thing. Um, this is a, a fun skin tone that we mixed and it was using some colors that we don't normally use like Rosy Skin Shadow and Blood Red. So there you go. Thanks everybody. And I hope you have a lovely week. And do remember to tune in to my stream tomorrow where I will continue working on this pretty cool bust. Um, and I do need to tackle a lot of the metallics. I need to bring down these little metallics to the point of the shoulder. And then we really need to add a lot more shadows to the shoulder. Um, and maybe we'll have time to do highlights, but I'm probably just going to concentrate on getting all the shadows all the way down. So please, 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 hopefully I'll see you tomorrow. Otherwise, have a great day, everybody, and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.